Well, let's read together from God's Word. We're going to read two uh, short sections from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 26, uh, verses 22 to 28, and then from Proverbs uh, chapter 29, verses uh, 1 uh, to 5. The first one we'll find on page 696 of the Pew Bibles, Proverbs uh, 26 beginning at verse 22. And we ask God to bless the reading of His infallible and inerrant and precious Word. The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body, like the glaze covering an earthen vessel are fervent lips with an evil heart. Whoever hates disguises himself with his lips and harbors deceit in his heart. When he speaks graciously, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Though his hatred be covered with deception, his wickedness will be exposed in the assembly. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it, And a stone will come back on him who starts it rolling. A lying tongue hates its victims, and a flattering mouth works ruin. And then turning over to page 698, we come to chapter 29, Proverbs 29, and we read the first five verses. He who is often reproved yet stiffens his neck will suddenly be broken beyond healing. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. He who loves wisdom makes his father glad, but a companion of prostitutes squanders his wealth. By justice, a king builds up the land, but he who exacts gifts tears it down. A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. Finish there at the end of verse 5. Now, it's that verse that we uh, just read there a moment ago, uh, verse 5, that I want to focus on uh, this morning, and it challenges us, or this evening rather, it challenges us to think about uh, a topic Uh, And I want to connect this verse with several other verses that we find in the book of Proverbs and indeed uh, throughout the Scripture. So, in a sense, this is my text, but I'll be ranging quite widely as we think about what uh, the Bible has to say about flattery. A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. And we saw that in uh, chapter 26. Uh, a lying tongue uh, hates its victims, and a flattering mouth works ruin. So, I want to think about how that works. Uh, how does a flattering mouth ruin people? Uh, how does flattery spread uh, a net? We want to think about how it deceives people, how it catches people in a web of deceit. Flattery ruins friendships, I mean real friendships, because it stands in the way of those honest conversations that need to take place at times. Flattery ruins politicians. It makes for bad government when uh, rulers, those who are making important decisions that affect the lives of people, Uh, are surrounded by people who only tell them what they want to hear, and as a result, they make bad decisions. Flattery can sometimes silence us in our witness and our evangelism. You may have heard people say things like, I'm sure you're not one of those close-minded fundamentalists who bang on about getting saved. You see what's happening there. It's flattery, and it aims to get you to tone down what you might say about the gospel. And flattery ruins ministry. It ruins preachers. 
It ruins what uh, elders of the church need to do. Because when we become addicted to praise, we preach sermons that people will like. We enjoy being flattered, and it traps us in a net of delusion. But flattery isn't just a topic. It's interesting how the book of Proverbs never speaks about flattery. It speaks about the one who flatters, the flatterer, because the flatterer is a real-life person. We've all met them, we've all heard them, and maybe we've spoken it. Maybe we've been one uh, ourselves. And the flatterer is a character in uh, John uh, Bunyan's here, I'll move on to um, uh, uh, actually this next one. In John Bunyan's uh, uh, classic uh, allegory, The Pilgrim's Progress, about uh, Pilgrim, or Christian as he later becomes, he leaves the city of destruction because he's read in his book, the Bible, that he is in trouble. He's got a burden on his back, the burden of sin, and he sets out to find his way to uh, the heavenly city. He's joined by Faithful, uh, who eventually is put to death at Vanity Fair, and after that he meets up with Hopeful, and together they travel until they come to the river, and they cross over and enter the, uh, the celestial city, the, the heavenly city. Now, as I was just this afternoon, over, or uh, as we were having lunch together, I uh, saw in the church library this uh, little abridged version uh, of the Pilgrim's Progress. Excuse me, Lucilla, I borrowed it without taking it out, but I will put it back. But I just thought I'd mention it to you. It's an ex extract, a series of extracts uh, from this classic work, a work that I, I really would encourage you to either read the abridged version or, or the full thing. It's well worth it. <coughs> because along the way, uh, Christian and hopeful meet uh, uh, people who encourage them. Uh, people like evangelists, and, and, and these people represent real-life people that you and I will meet along the way. Evangelist who gives them a scroll and, and points them to, the, to the, na the narrow gate. There's help who comes along and pulls, uh, pulls, uh, pulls them out of the slough of despond. There's goodwill who pulls them through the narrow gate when he's uh, holding back and, and teaches some really important lessons. Then there are the four shepherds, knowledge, experience, watchful, and sincere. And they meet them in the delectable mountains, which come just after Doubting Castle, uh, and give them uh, real encouragement and wisdom and advice to uh, carry on the way. But it's not just these positive characters that a Pilgrim comes across. There are uh, fearsome characters, enemies, larger-than-life characters who, who grip our attention. There's Mr. Worldly Wise Man, and he comes from the town of Carnal Polity, which really is, a, I guess, maybe an old-fashioned way of saying worldly wisdom. Uh, or the common sense of the world, and he very freely gives his opinions about uh, what he thinks is common sense. We might call him a rationalist. Uh, reason is all that matters. Push the Bible to one side. Reason is, is the way to go. And then there's Apollyon, the destroyer, and he's covered in the scales of a fish, has the wings of a dragon, and the feet of a bear. He breathes out smoke and, uh, and uh, Pilgrim struggles for a day and a half until eventually he's delivered. In, in the town of Vanity Fair, there's Judge Hate Good, and he has a, a nasty looking jury of Mr. Blind Man, Mr. Reject Good, Mr. Love Lust, Mr. Live Loose, High Mind, and Hate Light, and they condemn faithful to a terrible death. And perhaps most vivid of all, giant despair with his club. And his wife will call her Mrs. Despair. And he locks Christian and Hopeful in a, a dungeon full of skulls in the hope that they will take their own lives. There's one character that, that's not so vividly 
described. But I'll, I think his description is really important. And that is the He is black of flesh, but covered with a very light, dark underneath, dark, morally dark, but disguised. And he casts Christian and hopeful in a net. And of course, Bunyan is referring to this verse that we're looking at tonight. Whoever uh, flatters his neighbor catches him or spreads a net for his feet. And what Bunyan does in his allegory is uh, explain how the flatterer can inflict ruin on those who listen, how he lays out a trap and what that net does, how it hinders our progress. And one of the interesting things is the flatterer may not sound as dangerous. He, he, he doesn't give off the vibe that Apollyon does or giant despair. He's not huge. He's not breathing flames. He's, he, he, he's uh, not like Judge Hitgood. Those are larger-than-life characters. Uh, the flatterer is, by comparison, really quite ordinary. But he can do a lot, a lot of damage. A lot of damage. And we see that in other verses. Proverbs uh, 26, 28, a lying tongue and a flattering mouth work ruin. There's a, a, an interesting series of references in Daniel chapter 11, which I'll, I'll grant you is a, is a difficult chapter. It's about a, a king from the north who comes and attacks and will come to attack uh, God's people. We're told in verse 21, Daniel 11, 21, that he will obtain his kingdom by flattery. But worse than that, later on, verse 32, with flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant. He will flatter the people of God, the covenant people of God, and lead them astray. He will corrupt them. He will lead them into sin. So if we're going to avoid that, first of all, we need to know what the flatterer does. How, what are we to look out for? What, what is it that is the problem? Well, flattery is very often uh, saying things that are good and true. They sound good. They sound true. They have the ring of truth to them, but they are said maliciously. Now, I want to draw that distinction there because uh, it we need to be able to say things that are good and true. We need to be able to give words of encouragement, and we need to be able to hear words of encouragement. You've heard me speak of that instance when Spurgeon was approached by a lady after the sermon one night, uh, and she says, Mr. Spurgeon, that was an excellent sermon, and he said, yes, Satan has told me that uh, already. Uh, and I think I've already said, I, I feel sorry for that poor woman. She was trying to bring a word of encouragement. Now, he was also alive to the temptations that his own soul was facing. So what I'm talking about here is it isn't always easy. We don't always get the balance right. But giving words of encouragement and receiving words of encouragement are really important skills to learn. Encouragement is not flattery. Encouragement is good, and it's true, it's realistic, but it's said with the aim uh, and the intention of building up, of strengthening. Flattery, however, may sound the same, but it is said maliciously. And it's so easy to misuse and misapply words. 
Because flattery maliciously aims to deceive. That's the point. And it's amazing, but good things, true things, can be said with the intention of deceiving. Paul speaks about that, and he speaks about what happens uh, amongst those who appear on the surface to be servants of Jesus Christ. Such people do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, in other words, their own ambitions. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. So there's people who are maybe uh, have the appearance of being servants of Jesus Christ, but are deceiving people by what they say. Psalm uh, 78, just to remind you of what we sang, we, we sang about the Israelites, and even, even in their worship, even as they uh, drew near to God, even as they remembered God and cried out to Him for help, they flattered Him with their mouths. They lied to Him with their tongues. It's a rather shocking thought, isn't it, that, that people might flatter God, that what sounds like worship, sounds reverend and awesome and, and pious, can actually be flattery when we try to manipulate God, when we try to deceive God. Now, of course, it's impossible to deceive God, but it's worth thinking what happens in people's minds? What are people thinking when they try to uh, deceive God? So, how does the flatterer deceive? How does the flatterer trap us or uh, others? And I want to note three ways in which uh, the flatterer tries to deceive. Uh, they try to cultivate a wrong view of ourselves, a wrong view of ourselves. They want us to believe things about ourselves that just are not true. They say nice things, perhaps, not because they believe them, but because they're trying to manipulate us. Uh, Jude uh, 1 verse 16 speaks about those who are grumblers, malcontents, following their own evil desires. They are loud mouths showing favoritism, or, or the NIV translates it there, flattering others. Literally, they admire the face. What a beautiful face you have. What a beautiful appearance you have. What a wonderful person you are. And we actually like the picture that they paint. That's the point. Even if it's not true, we like it, and we want to hear it. And even if it is true, we want to hear more of it, and we make more of those things than perhaps we ought to. You are so good at whatever it is, and you may be good at it, but don't you love to hear it? Don't you love others to point it out to you? Don't you like the thought that others might be saying, what a great person you are? And as you dwell on that, you forget why it is that God has given you that gift in the first place. You bask in the glory of your own giftedness. And we stop asking how can I use this talent for God? In fact, worse than that, we come to expect praise. We come to feel let down when others don't praise us, when we, we do something and we wait for the praise and it doesn't come and we go away crestfallen because flattery has trapped us in a net. That's dangerous. It's deceptive. But flattery can also deceive us with a wrong view of others, particularly the person who flatters us, the person who comes and says, what a wise person you are, how kind you are, 
you know, you're really, you're really, uh, really the bee's knees. We can actually think that that person is really wise when they're just flattering us. Flattery often builds us up to make us receptive to some, let's say, negative remark about someone else. It's interesting that, how flattery and slander often go in the same breath. Hey, I know you, 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 you're, you're really clever. You'll, you, you'll know that so-and-so is so full of himself. Flattery can often be the fluff, the chaff that distracts when people are trying to tell untruths about someone else. I remember uh, at a poultry show, uh, a judge uh, judging chooks at a poultry show, he says, you know, watch out, watch out when you've got a bird in a cage and someone has put in stacks and stacks of shavings. You put in shavings in, 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 a, in a show pen so that the bird has something soft to, to stand on. But if someone puts in a bucket of shavings, watch out. There's probably something wrong with the bird's foot. There's probably something wrong with its legs. It's probably got a twisted toe. And, and the same with flattery. It, 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 it's so much shavings and it's probably there to hide something, something deceitful. What is that person trying to Now, I'm not trying to suggest cynicism. We shouldn't be cynical. I, I really am not wanting to cultivate cynicism, but alertness, because that's what the book of Proverbs is about, godly wisdom in life. So, flattery uh, deceives us about ourselves. It, it often deceives us about others. And then, thirdly, it deceives us about our duty. People often flatter us, or when people flatter us, it's very often uh, to divert us from what we ought to be doing or what we ought to say. It's really hard to speak honestly to someone who has been buttering us up, isn't it? I, I remember that a man I, I had to speak to many years ago about his neglect of the means of grace, his neglect of coming to worship God with God's people, his neglect of coming to the Lord's Supper. And, it, and it's a serious thing, that. That's, a, that's, that. that's not an easy conversation to have. And I think the man sensed what I was talking about. So what did he do? He talked and he talked and he talked, but more than that, he didn't just fill the, word, <laughs> fill the room with words. He looked me in the eye and told me what a, what a wonderful pastor I was, what a caring person I was. And I wasn't like that other man who was so intense and, and just made him feel uncomfortable. I wasn't like him. It's actually very hard to say what you need to say when someone butters you up with flattery. We get distracted, and we do things, we say things, we don't do what we ought to do. We're silent when we should speak, and we speak when we should be silent. So, what, what, what do we do? Well, often we do nothing. We just stand there like a, a, labbit, a rabbit in the lamp. Now, in Pilgrim's Progress, this, this is where, uh, this is where uh, God steps in. Uh, and in uh, the picture that I showed earlier there, um, uh, one of the shining ones who may be an angel, may be a human being, uh, coming uh, in uh, uh, human form, uh, comes with what John Bunyan calls a whip of small cords. And when uh, Christian and Hopeful are trapped in the flatterer's net, he asks them questions. That's what a whip of small cords is. 
he, he asks them, who were you speaking to? And they say, oh, a fine spoken man. And he said, didn't I warn you? Why didn't you take care? Why didn't you pay attention? Didn't evangelist warn you? Didn't interpreter explain to you? Now, those are awkward questions, but that's the kind of plain speaking, honest friend that uh, the, the proverb speaks about. He who rebukes a man will in the end gain more favor than he who has a flattering tongue. So I say that because often it's God who steps in and rescues us from that net. But how can we avoid that net in the first place? How can we guard ourselves against the flatterer? Now, I want to say two things by way of answer to that question. And the first one is to cultivate the fear of God. To cultivate the fear of God. The fear of God is a love for God, a reverence for God, a desire for His pleasure, a desire that above all else, whatever we do, we please God. That liberates us from the net. Uh, the fear of man lays a snare. It's a different word, but it's the same idea. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts the Lord is safe. The fear of man lays a snare because we're afraid of what people will say to us. We're afraid of what people will think of us. We're afraid of what they might say about us. We're afraid that they might say, oh, that religious nutcase, that fundamentalist, that, that weirdo. And we don't like to be talked about in those terms. But that's the fear of man. And the only antidote to the fear of people is the fear of God. What God thinks matters more than anything else. What does God hear? What does God say? What does God see? What does God think? That's what matters. So cultivate the fear of God. And then secondly, rejoice in the righteousness of of Jesus Christ. That is the righteousness that those who trust in Jesus are covered with, clothed with. Uh, sinners who come to God unworthy, whose words, whose thoughts, whose actions are all offensive in His sight. But when we confess that, when we confess them, He covers us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when he looks at us, what does he see? He sees the beauty of Jesus. When he, when he talks about us, what does he describe? He describes the character of Jesus. And, and, I, and I, want to, I want to finish by stressing that because often the reason why we're vulnerable to, to flattery is because we're insecure. We're unsure what others think of us. But we can be absolutely sure what God thinks about us. And that's why we need to focus on that. Another reason why we can be vulnerable uh, to flattery is because we think too highly of ourselves and our own natural abilities, our own talents. In fact, our expectations of praise are up here. What we actually get is here. And it irks us, and it, and it annoys us. And we find relief in flattery. We crave human approval. But the point I want to make is that human approval pales into utter insignificance. It's like that compared to God's well done, 
good and faithful servant. Flattery is just like a mist. It, it, it's praise from people who don't really mean it, who don't really believe it, who don't really care. God's well done is truth from a God who loves us and who has given His Son to save us in spite of who we are, in spite of who we are. And the satisfaction that flows from the righteousness, being clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, is rich and deep. John Newton, the converted slave trader, was a man who had no need for flattery, nor had he any time for it. He said, I am a great sinner. I am a great sinner. But I have a good, a great Savior. And if you're able to say that, if you're able to say that, you're well on the way to guarding yourself against the trap of flattery. I am an unworthy sinner. I deserve nothing, but I've got a great Savior. And what He thinks is what matters more than anything else in the world. Let's pray together. Father God in heaven, we, we thank You for Jesus. We thank You for His work that is perfect, finished, complete. We thank you, Father, for the, the declaration that you have already made not guilty because of Jesus. And, Father, we look forward to the, the uh, final public declaration on the day when Christ comes back and the world is judged. Well done, good and faithful servant. Father, encourage us with these words. Help us, O oh God, to find our true purpose and worth in the gospel and not in the changing opinions of people. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.